All right, welcome to today's webinar. Okay, so we're talking about developing a continuing education plan for yourself and your team. And we're gonna make lots of connections to continuing education for CPA, so CPE, um, and talk about sort of the practicality of that and should we do this and why would we do this? So let's go through some of the administrative things first. My name is Tom Waddleton. I am a virtual CFO with Summit CPA Group. Um, I've been here for about five years and I'll be facilitating and participating in today's session. So some of the administrative things, um, we do have CPE credit offered for today's session and you do have to attend the entire 50 minute session. We'll have three polling questions. I'll launch the first one here really soon. One of the most common questions that we get from people is, will I get a CPE certificate and can I get copies of the slides? So you can see they will be emailed out if you get it. And then also we will send replay slides, email is available. Now, maybe one of the most important things as part of the webinar, you can't actually speak to us during here, but we really are very interested in people's questions. We'd like to be as interactive as this format will let us be. So if you will do that, we will be monitoring questions and try to fit them in where it fits best within the program. So please take advantage of doing that. Okay, so I mentioned that I work for Summit CPA Group. So let me tell you just a little bit about our company. The firm was started 20 years ago. Since 2004, we have been providing CFO and back office accounting services. That is our primary business that we do as an organization. About nine years ago, we became a fully distributed firm. So get rid of the office, remote workers. Our team is across the nation, do everything virtually through meetings or through Zoom-like meetings. And our clients are also across the U.S. and then quite a few outside the U.S. As of present, Summit has become a division of Ander CPA and Advisors, and that happened earlier this year. And so we're now part of a bigger organization, really excited about the things that that can bring to us. Okay, so having done that, let me tell you about our speakers that we have today. Josh Jeans is in charge of people operations. He's our strategist and works with Summit CPA Group. So Josh, welcome. Blake Oliver is the founder and CEO of Earmark, and so you'll learn a little bit more about Earmark, and we'll even see a demo of what they can provide. And so we're bringing an expert on education and CPE knowledge. So Blake, welcome. And I introduce myself here. So as I mentioned CPE, let me get us started here. You should be very familiar with NASPA, the National Association of State Board of Accountancy. They have a registry and in many states, if you are registered with NASBA to give continuing education, then it can count toward continuing licensure. And so for example, I'm in Indiana and a requirement in Indiana is that you have an average of 40 hours. So a three year time period, 120 hours, a minimum of 20 hours per year that you have. Um, that become very important. Some states, Indiana is not one where you have to be registered, but there are states where you have to be at the same time, NASBA is really good at keeping track of what those guidelines and things are. So while we're going, I'm going to go ahead and launch the first poll question as we get started for people. Give me one second here. Okay, so that has been launched. So one thing I will mention, I'll mention a little bit later, depending on the size of your firm, it may be worth you getting your firm registered as you talk about education saying, here's what I would like people to learn. It may be worth going through the process yourself so that your own team members, as they learn the things you think are important, are also getting continuing education for that. And so I'll mention just a little bit of that here in a second. Okay, so we mentioned continuing education. We're gonna take this and, and launch from these places, but I would make the argument that there's a broken cycle of CPE. So in three different things, and I'll expand on the first one, that the requirement for CPE, as I mentioned, the minimum hours per year, the minimum hours for a three-year cycle, keeping your license, doesn't equate to learning. Also, we would suggest then creating a development plan can be overwhelming. So if that's a better way to do it, and can we demystify and make it, that seem a little bit easier, and then is it difficult to find the best resources? So some of the argument that I will make for the CPE current model being broken, I think, and I'll just go from my own experience and from stories from other CPAs, I think people often look for, okay, it's a requirement. I need to turn in paperwork if I'm asked at the end of the period, but I'm going to try to find the cheapest, the easiest, the most efficient way to get through that without very much thought about, am I really learning and doing that? And I would argue that combining those things is a really worthwhile thing to do. You probably have your own stories, but I've been at conferences where if you look around the room, it seems like a very large portion of the people are on their phones and maybe they're taking notes on the conference. If I give them the benefit of the doubt, probably not. And so you're saying, okay, you're getting CPE, but you're completely checked out working on your email or whatever else seems important. Um, Josh and I work with somebody named Zach, who's also in our HR 
department and Josh Zach mentioned that he went to my state society and was starting to teach a class. And he said in the back, he could see people with feet up on the desk and reading newspapers during a continuing education program. And he's like, is that how it works? And I said, well, I hope that that was a minority, but yes, you've got people who paid to come into a course and didn't appear to be paying any attention during that. And I've even had people who will brag about, you know, I've got two sessions going at the same time because I have two screens. And as long as I just keep clicking that I'm active in those. So those will all be my things that would say, okay, it, it, I don't think that equates to learning um, that's in there. So that'll be the point that I'll make here. Josh, I guess I'll go to you and let's talk about, okay, if there's a better way, can you tell us a little bit more about development plans and maybe they don't have to be so overwhelming? Yeah, absolutely, Tom. Uh, I agree uh, completely. You know, if you're going to spend on average 40 hours a year doing something, you may as well make it worthwhile. It doesn't make sense to take such uh, a big chunk of valuable time. I know a lot of people think that they're effectively uh, multitasking while doing that. It's probably not true. We tend to have uh, some overestimation of self when it comes to multitasking, but uh, or maybe some people are a little more shameless and their feet up on the desk. But uh, yeah, we really want to make the argument that if you're going to take the time, if you're going to allocate the resources to do continuing education, we want to make sure that it's effectively applied to your position, to your trajectory in your career, to the organization that you're a part of. Uh, so there's a couple things we want to talk about here. Really, in essence, what we're getting at is we want to encourage you to be more strategic in your development. What that's going to necessitate is that you take a step back and have some higher level thinking and a, a longer uh, perspective on your own personal development and professional development. The first question uh, I would have you sit with is, you know, do you have a competency framework in place? Now that can be both applied to your uh, yourself, your view of self and your career and what you're doing. It also can be applied to the organization that you're operating inside of. Um, I think there's you know, two pieces we want to look at with a competency framework. We, bo we both want to evaluate internal metrics and external metrics. So when it comes to my personal competency in my role, when I'm looking at internal metrics, how am I operating on a team? Am I able to move into an area of my best and highest contribution within the dynamics of my team? And if I'm not, what are the areas of competency I need to grow in so that I can really rise to the occasion and be providing my best in my current role? How does my own competency and growth therein also help to contribute to the rest of the folks on my team? What's going to give them more margin and more freedom to do their best work because, uh, because I really dialed in my own development? Similarly, we want to have external metrics when it comes to our competency. So we were having a great conversation before we started recording here about um, the difference between having subject area expertise and being able to present that information and how those <laughs> things can be really misaligned. And I'm sure you've probably all had the experience of talking to somebody that you know in your heart of hearts is brilliant but you're just really not getting it from them. And you're just kind of trying to pull that string, like, please, come on, you can do it, I know. <laughs> um, and I'm sure you've probably had the opposite experience where you've sat with somebody who just captivated you and could take command of the room and maybe upon reflection realize, like, I don't know if they actually knew what they were talking about, <laughs> uh, but they really crushed it in that presentation. When it comes to external metrics, what I mean by that is we want to make sure that we're measuring various elements of our own competence when it comes to how we interact with clients, um, stakeholders and other organizations, whoever it is that you're working with on a regular basis, both in your subject area expertise and in your ability to convey that expertise to another person in your ability to present the work that you've done as valuable, as meaningful, and something that ought to be integrated or taken seriously and moving forward. So um, I think another big piece there with a competency framework that's important to consider is uh, what is the team impact going to be based on a competency framework that we've set up? As I grow in my own personal competencies, what is that going to grow on my team? 
will it allow me to move forward and make space for somebody else to come beneath me into the role that I was previously in? Will, will it allow me to strengthen and sharpen the other people on my team? That's another important piece. Josh, this, if, oh, if I'm yeah, hearing you and feeling like, okay, that's a blank sheet of paper for me, this competency framework, would you suggest ways that someone could look inside their own organization and say, okay, here's where you could build something from things that might exist within your organization or maybe look outside if you're looking for kind of examples and, and things like that to say, how do I start to build a straw of what that might look like? Yeah. Let's start inside the organization. Is it typical that you could look inside and say, maybe it's not called this, but here's how you could sort of hang on to the, the key parts of it? Yeah, that's a great question, Tom. I would say in at the risk of oversimplifying it, I would say mm -hmm. a great place to start is where's the job description for your current role? And it can be really valuable to go to, you know, whether it's the hiring manager or your direct manager or the HR team to take an earnest evaluation of the job description for your current role and ask yourself, you know, am I, am I at a B plus or A minus in each of these mm -hmm. skills at least, or are there some of these skills that maybe I, um, overrepresented myself when I interviewed right. or there are places where I've been able to skate by because there's other people on my team who are really strong in this area. Uh, but that's a great place to start because it's, it's something that's concrete. You can hold it. I mean, you could print it off, highlight things, old school, whatever you want to do there, but that's a great place to start is what is actually expected of me in my role. And a lot of times somebody who is highly capable you're going to be able to work around some of your own weaknesses and you may not have cause for reflection to go back and realize, oh, I, I didn't realize that this actually was a part of what I should be doing. I've been leaning on somebody else on my team to do, I, I don't revenue recognition and uh -huh. I haven't actually been put on the spot and made to do this. And I want to, I want to be able to, if the time comes that my trusty rev rec friend isn't at work or I, I need somebody to lean on here um it's important to go back and and reassess what was asked of me in this role similarly if you have aspirations to move up in your organization or to mm -hmm. to move up in, an, in a different company it's really easy to do a quick google search and find a job description of the next role that you want to be in if you're a staff accountant for example and you really want to move into a senior role you can do the same exercise, pull up that job description and say, okay, here, 60% of these things I feel really confident in. I think I could do it right now on the spot. And 40% of these things, you know, or maybe it's 20%. I think I <laughs> could do depending on the circumstances and 20%. I am clueless. I would have no clue where to start. I need to start at ground zero here, start to build some competency, maybe take some coursework on it. Um, but that's, so that's a somewhat technical way of looking at what are the competencies I want to grow in. Okay. Uh, I, I um, love that. If I can just reflect one piece back that the homework that you're giving around looking up job descriptions and things like Googling those seems great. I think that could also turn into a really good conversation with a boss and or a mentor, right? That I could see sitting down with my boss and saying, Hey, I went through this exercise and I evaluated myself. Can we compare notes? Cause I think I'm absolutely killing it here. And this is the area that I want to work on. And if I trust that boss, I would love to hear their feedback. And maybe they say, you know, I don't think you're really killing it, but that's not the area that I would work on. I think you do pretty well there. Um, and probably the same thing that as I read what it takes to get to that next level, the technical leader, the partner, something like that to say, mm -hmm. what I read is it's this and here's the gap and get that same kind of feedback of here's where I think you would need to grow. And, and yes, I agree. That's what it says. But what people are really looking for is maybe something different. Yeah, absolutely, Tom. And I think that bleeds over directly into the second point here of mm -hmm. asking that question, do you have a development plan for yourself? Starting there with self, I think the most important kind of question underneath the question there is who are you consulting with that? Mm. It's it's really valuable to have a developmental plan for yourself, whether that's, you know, you've taken a couple hours on a Saturday morning to sit at your favorite coffee shop and just dream about where do I want to be in 10 years and what is it going to take to get me there? But that's really valuable. It can be a very anchoring experience, but it's also really important to bring in exactly what you said, Tom, some of those trusted advisors 
to ask, mm -hmm. what are you seeing in me? And I'll say when it comes to um, professional and personal development, there's some competing ideologies of either find your strengths and focus only on those things, just develop your strengths and live there. Other people would say, isolate your weaknesses, make sure to, to tighten those things up. I'm, I personally think there's, there's space to do both of those things. And if you have an mm -hmm. earnest, honest partner that you're working with, they're going to help illuminate both of those areas for you. Hey, here's some of those yellow flags. I want to make sure that you grow in your understanding or your capabilities enough so that they're not a problem for you down the road, but here's your sweet spot. And I'd really love to see you grow in this particular area to press into this set of strengths that you have. Um, I think something that's really critical there with the people you're consulting around a development plan is also that you find people who can see your blind spots. It's really important mm -hmm. to consult people who are going to see things in you that you don't see in yourself, whether that's, um, you know, you need to, uh, what I would affectionately call fix your face. <laughs> you're reacting <laughs> poorly in client meetings and we can actually read it and you've got to take the time to, oh, let's watch this meeting back and see how you reacted and watch yourself in real time. Um, let's work on this area. You know, I, I noticed that you look grumpy when this person speaks out of turn or uh, you get really flustered when you're interrupted and you have a hard time getting back on track or um, maybe it's a blind spot, kind of like we talked about earlier that you're really strong in these, these areas and you've been able to kind of snake your way around some other responsibilities in your role because you really shine in these two or three things. You want to have somebody who's honest enough and firm enough with you to say, I, I care about you. I care about where you're going, how you're developing. And I've noticed that these are some weak spots and you're trying to avoid them or you're, you're not pressing in there. But we need to make sure to, um, to patch these spots before moving on to you know, a different level in this organization or taking on higher uh, level responsibility. So um, I love I love that question, Tom, and where you got there. Uh, I think it's important too to have a development plan for your team. The same thing with competency. Mm -hmm. As our team is growing, depending on the size of your team, you know how many of the people on our team need to really be generalist. How many people have need to have really deep knowledge in certain areas. How much can we diversify across our team and have specialists who really thrive in that face-to-face -face client interaction and somebody else who really thrives in some of those special projects and deep cleanups? Uh, some of that's going to depend really on the size of your organization and what your team makeup is, but it's important there that you're not alone in creating that de development plan, that you've got yeah. other people that you can uh, weigh in with. And if you're joining us and you're leading a team right now, I would really encourage you. I think the temptation is to feel pressure as a leader to create this on your own and to present it proudly and without any hesitation. And the reality is your, your team will feel valued and seen, and they'll be more responsive to a development plan if they've been consulted in creating that development plan for the team. Yeah. Josh, let me interrupt for one sec. So I just launched the poll related to that. So let me go ahead and show these results. So you should be able to see on the screen that it looks like, what is that, 60% of the people said that either they doubt anyone has a development plan or the employee has to take their own initiative. And so the bot, you said kind of be the boss that helps people do it. It looks like it's only the 40% category that like someone is actually helping them mm -hmm. to do that plan. So I, I agree with you completely. And uh, I've worked for organizations that had a formal development plan process. And it was nice to have sort of this template and that you were expected out of those conversations. It sounds like most of our people are not in that environment. So do you have a suggestion for kind of what that might look like and how you have the conversation to say, hey, boss, here's what I'm thinking. And can you give me some feedback on that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, without um, launching a new webinar, I'll share this these thoughts. Okay, please. sure. Okay. This, I think this is really starting to press in on what the future of work will look like. And hmm. um, the future of work is very employee centric. It's gonna, we're gonna have to, as leaders lean more and more into what does fulfillment look like for our teams. And um, in short, we don't have the same dynamics where there's an understood 
uh, employee employer uh, sense of loyalty over a 30 or 40 year mm-hmm. career where somebody's going to stick it out and they're not going to be, you know, looking for different opportunities. Uh, we're in an environment where the amount of information available to people is so great. And the amount of insight that you can gather on other people's experiences in different workplaces is so great that this actually becomes a huge retention tool as well. Because we're not only wanting to grow our people so that the product we're developing, the services that we're providing are enhanced, but also that the people on our team feel seen, that they feel like what they do is important, but also who they are is important, who they're growing into. And really on the people side of things, I would would make the argument that we really need to support our teams whether we think they're going to stay with us for the next 10 years or not. Um, Really, I I want to understand that in 2022, employment is much more transient than it has been historically. And we may have Mm -hmm. somebody on our team for a season of their life, and they may may move on in another season of their life when it makes sense for them. And that's okay. Um, We happen to have several people on our team here who have returned to Summit because in their time here, they felt like they got community with their team. They got help with their professional and personal development. Maybe a, um, a move or family circumstances caused them to look at a different opportunity for a time, but they returned. And almost across the board, that's because they enjoyed their experience as an employee and the work that they were getting to do, not just the output that they had. Yep. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, are you ready to move on to our next? Yeah, we can go ahead and point. move on and I'll hand it over to, to Blake here. Yeah, so Blake, there's different ways of doing it. We'd love to hear more about your thoughts of how might you approach getting it now that you know what you want to learn. Yeah, definitely. There's lots of ways to earn CPE these days. Uh, first, I want to thank you, though, for playing that two cellos video at the beginning <laughs> of the webinar. Uh, I'm a career changer. I was as a cellist before I became a CPA. Yeah. So uh, that was the the reason for that video. Nice. Uh, and I actually, I used to own one of those Yamaha electric cellos myself. And I gigged in, in LA for about eight months. And then I realized that playing with bands uh, as a cellist wasn't exactly gonna pay the bills. It wasn't what I really wanted to do. <laughs> and <laughs> and so, was, it, was it rock uh, bands? I mean, was it that kind of music or was it something different that you yep. It was, uh, okay. I, I played with some like uh, experimental rock bands, progressive rock bands, uh, indie, you know, folk kind of stuff, all uh, uh, even um, uh, uh, fiddle music, you know, like Celtic oh, okay. and, yeah. and bluegrass. Yeah. Um, I love to improvise. And uh, so that was that was what I did. Um, got into uh, accounting uh, through bookkeeping. You know, uh, people would pay me to do bookkeeping work, and I realized that was great because I could put on my earbuds, I could listen to music, I could come in, and it was flexible. And I found I really loved accounting. I loved the theory of accounting. The debits and credits made sense to me as a musician. Accounting is a system, just like musical scales and chords is a system. And it's actually elegantly beautiful and simple but very complex in practice. And that's the same thing with music theory. Music only has 12 notes, right? In accounting, we only have debits and credits, and yet Mm -hmm. we manage to create these very amazing systems and information out of it. So uh, that's just a little bit of background on me. Um, So yeah, let's talk about, uh, you know, resources for CPE. Um, I don't know if anyone noticed, but I have a hard time sitting still. (laughs) <laughs> and especially when I'm listening and like if I'm in front of my computer, I have a really hard time focusing on a webinar. Um, and, and maybe that's how I ended up getting into doing webinars is that I couldn't sit still listening to them. So I ended up doing them. Uh, same thing with with in-person seminars, though. I would, you know, go to conferences and I would try to sit in a room. But really, I just wanted to be out in the hallway talking to all the other firm owners, you know, because mm-hmm. I, I had my own my own uh, accounting firm. And uh, so that's always been my problem with conferences, seminars. It's sort of like this one person talking up on stage and then everybody else listening. But really where I got the most was from having conversations with people. Um, And I think 
that is where continuing professional education can change is now that we have uh, the internet and social media and, and podcasting, uh, we can make it more personal and we can make it more conversational, I think. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, that's, that's what I've been doing with Earmark CPE is it's a way to get uh, CPE for listening to podcasts. And it's awesome that Summit has been an early adopter of, of Earmark and creating content for Earmark and all that. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that's, uh, if you want me to talk any more about these different resources, um, but if like, I, I'd love to show you Earmark. Yeah, yeah, let's do that in one second. And actually let's do Earmark first. And then I'll talk a little about how you might be able to do CPE within your own organization. But let's, let's do the Earmark piece first. All right, okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to share my screen. Okay. And I'll try to get my phone up here on my screen as well. Let's see here. Always fun doing live demonstrations. Sure. Okay, share. There we go. Yep. Oh, and by the way, you know, if you want to participate and you just don't want to sit back and relax, I mean, I understand if you just want to listen, but I would love to hear from the attendees. What is your least favorite part of CPE? Yeah, so if people don't mind, put, most... put that in the question function, please. And that would be a great way to that we can hear that. Yeah, I would love to know. Uh, so for me, again, it's like being able to sit still. Um, so this is an app called Earmark CPE. You can download this on the Apple App Store. You can download it on Android, uh, Google Play Store. Uh, this is an app I've been working on for a year or two now. Uh, and what it lets you do is uh, earn CP credit for listening to podcasts. So for instance, um, here is an episode of the Modern CPA Success Show, what Eating Kale taught Geraldine Carter about the accounting profession and pricing. So <laughs> if, if you wanted to learn about pricing, you can hear Adam Hale, Jody Grundon, and Geraldine Carter talk about how changing your mindset using simple mm -hmm. solutions mm -hmm. you know, can implement these strategies. Uh, and so you would simply enroll in the course. Yes, now you're enrolled. Uh, and this is the episode. So you can go listen to it. You can go watch it on YouTube. And this opens up in the YouTube app on your phone. And I think it's actually going to just start playing on my phone here. There you go. There we go. Oh, there you are, Tom. Look at that. Good. Looking good. <laughs> then when you're done, when you're done listening to the episode or watching the episode, um, and this works for YouTube videos and podcasts, then you can go to the review questions. You know, we, we, we satisfy the NASBA QAS self-study format. So you, you get these three optional review questions, multiple choice. Those are actually optional. I don't have to do them. So I'm going to go ahead and skip them. Um, and then I take a five question quiz, multiple choice. You have to get four out of the five, right? And if you do, you can get your CPE certificate. Let me go to a course I've already completed so I can look at my certificate. Let's see, here's a course that I've completed. Here we go. And then this is what you see when you pass a quiz, and then you can hit that button at the top to email yourself a CP certificate, and it's in your inbox. So, you know, for me, uh, this is the way that I can actually listen and focus because I can go out and I can be listening to something while I'm walking the dog or I'm doing dishes or I, I'm doing other things, right? So I can be more productive. And, and to me like that, hopefully for some of you that are listening, you know, if, if you have trouble sitting in front of your computer, or you have trouble in a seminar focusing, you know, you can, you can download this app and you can listen on demand. Uh, so Blake, and, and my, one of the questions yeah, that's ahead, right Tom. in your real house, you're showing it yeah. perfect. Someone said, what is the name of the app again? So you're showing the app and then if you're on the app you're store, Yep, and they can see what it's Earmark supposed to CPE, look like. Yeah. So if you go into the App Store on your iPhone, then you can search for, you just go to the search and you type Earmark, and then we come up right there, and here we are. Perfect. And you can see we've got, you know, uh, what is it, 313 ratings and a 4.9 star nice. rating on, uh, on the App Store. So. Yeah. So some yeah. feedback we got, you asked about people's questions. One person says, I agree, sitting still for 50 plus minutes is really hard. Another comment someone had said is that 
CPE doesn't add up for other credits other than the CPA. So I can't get credit for my college continuing education and CPA. Um, I think yeah. there may be some course. I know Actually, people who are lawyers who they can get it for both, but but it's, uh, this, it, this person, Stephanie, I assume you're correct. And it you're depends saying. on your state. Some states will issue CPE credit, will allow you to claim it for college level coursework. You mm -hmm. just have to send in the transcript, I think, with your okay. renewal. But okay. it's a state by state thing. Yeah. Okay, we have one. I'm I'm not sure how to answer this. Okay. How do you sell the idea of, of the advantages of having a regular training program and dedicated portion of staff time to a stingy managing partner who's super cost sensitive, doesn't allow attendance to CPE only to the extent that it's required by public accounting firms? Right. How do you convince someone this, this is, is a big important? Yeah, so this is the problem in a firm, yeah, in a firm where people have to be billable and you're doing timesheets, right? CPE comes out of billable time. Now, let's set aside the debate over timesheets and whether or not that's the right thing to do. Uh, personally, I'd say, like, let's avoid them. Uh, but if, we ha if we're in that system where we've got to deal with that, uh, well, actually, you know, uh, uh, something like this, Earmark, is a good solution for people because you can multitask. You can truly multitask and actually learn while you're doing it. So go work out and take a CPE course while you're at it, right? While you're on the treadmill. Mm -hmm. I actually, yeah. one of our users, one of our users uh, said she was uh, at the spa getting her nails done and getting CPE. Yeah. And I love that. Yeah. So I think you made the reference to podcasts and the app itself looks a lot like many podcast channels that you can scroll through and say, well, that topic does look interesting. So I'll listen to that. Um, it, it looks very much similar to that, which I think is a really cool interface. Yeah. I, the idea is just that we want to make it simple. So um, I, I just feel like CPE, the way it's currently delivered, a lot of times it's just not easy and, and that's okay. I mean, it's not bad, but it's, we're all so busy as CPAs. We, right. we have like no time, right? So it needs to be easier and faster and cheaper. Um, and, and I feel like part of the reason that you know, I got, I got, I used to deliver CPE webinars for a couple of tech companies and I got frustrated doing it because, you know, people would be on the webinar just because it fit into their schedule, not because it was actually what they wanted mm -hmm. to learn. Mm -hmm. And so I think if we can, if we can de-link the, the need to be there live um, and allow people to learn right. on demand, then they can take what's, you know, more relevant to their uh, learning plan that Josh was talking about. Right. And it actually will fit into that. And so, uh, what I love about what you're doing is you're doing the live webinars so people can get the benefit of asking questions and being there live, but then you also put it on demand on the Airmark app. So it's like the best of both worlds. And yeah. uh, one additional question that's in here perfectly, um, what's the cost of the Earmark CPE app? So we're a freemium app, uh, sort of like, I think of like the New York Times where you can get one article you know, per week for free and if you, you know, do too many, then, you know, they ask you to subscribe. So that's how Earmark is set up. So you get one free CP course a week. You take that, you just have to wait another week. But if you buy a subscription okay. for a hundred dollars a year, then it's unlimited. So that's for okay. all the people that have, you know, uh, banked the CPE hours they need to learn, you know, until the end of the year, Yes, you can buy a <laughs> subscription and, and support the app. And then, yeah. Um, so so that's that's Good. how we do it. Freemium, you know, you can it's free to earn one a week, and then uh, uh, we also are adding in paid courses too. So eventually, you know, our our authors, if they create content they think is, you know, premium, then they can put it up on the Earmark app and say, I want to charge nine ninety nine for this, or I want to charge ninety nine mm -hmm. ninety nine for this. It's up to them. So the idea is for it to be a, a platform for uh, anyone to share their knowledge. Okay. And but yeah, that's great. Hi. Okay, go ahead, Josh. To go back really quickly to, um, I think it was the stingy managing partner. Yes. Um, something I think that's really important there that that could be appropriate in this environment is to make a business case to this managing partner for mm -hmm. uh, what are retention metrics, what is the cost to hire for your employees if they 
start to get the sense that they are just being used as resource instead of being valued as a person and as a professional. And I think when we look at somebody and expect them to be at an unreasonably high billable rate without any sort of empathy or insight into their fulfillment in their role, their development. Um, I think also we we just see an increase in productivity and the quality of work when our staff get the care and the guidance and the development that they need. Otherwise, they're going to persist in doing pretty much the same level and quality of work that they have always done. They're just going to be churning through it over and over again. Uh, yeah. So I, I would probably present uh, a business case if the stingy part is what I'm really leaning into to look sure. at, uh, especially in this hiring market, you can be looking at anywhere from a quarter to a third of that person's annual salary as their replacement cost. And that's if you can find somebody fairly quickly. Um, yeah. So the, the risk that you run of losing people because you haven't done that development for them uh, is pretty high. And the reality is more and more firms, more and more of your competitors are doing it now. And that's where they're going to go. They're going to go somewhere that will see them as a whole person that will build in time for their training and for their development and for their betterment. Um, and the amount of firms and organizations that are doing that is growing. So their opportunities are going to continue to grow to go somewhere else where they feel more appreciated if that becomes an issue that's recurring. Yeah. So Josh, you just got a live. Thanks for the answer. I really appreciate it. I feel like you may have partially answered another question that came in while you were answering this. I don't know if we can totally answer this because of the legal part, but you're probably seeing the question. Okay, since CPE could be really expensive over time and will have an impact on the firm's bottom line, I assume we're talking about the expense, is it legal to bond the staff so that they have to stay for a certain period of time? So I assume the question is, you know, yes, I'll invest this, but you need to commit to being here for another X number of years. Um, I think my first answer to that partly would be, I don't know about the legal part, so I'm not going to try that piece. Where mm -hmm. I thought your answer applied, Josh, was if that really hits you the wrong way, which that does to me, if it's part of continuing education, there are plenty of other places that don't do that. I think part of letting your employer know if you're trying to do that is this is something that will likely make people not want to stay at your organization and other places don't do that. Maybe there's a caveat around the expense. I mean, I assume if employees coming in and saying, okay, I want to go to two really expensive conferences during the year, and this is the only way I can get CPE. Maybe there's an exception there of someone being kind of unreasonable or things are expensive, but in most cases, you can get CPE at a pretty reasonable cost, especially as Blake's saying, it can be free for the self-study, at least one, one credit a week. I mean, Tom, Josh, this just, this is crazy to me. Like <laughs> we have a that, that, that somebody would think this way. I mean, I, I understand that there are people in our profession that think this way, that like if I allow my staff to spend time on CPE and money on CPE, that's a cost to the firm. And yes. like, I should get something out of it. But one of the top reasons that people leave a firm is because they don't feel like they have professional development opportunities. So if you don't give them the opportunity to learn and to develop themselves, they're gonna go somewhere else. And like you said, yeah. what's the cost of replacing that person, right? Yeah. Or worse, what if they stay and they don't improve? <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. I, it just short, it's just short sighted thinking that is uh, unfortunately too prevalent in the accounting profession. It is not investing in our people. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Like what you're hitting on there, it's hard to quantify the damage to your reputation as a firm if you become seen as this miserly group of folks who doesn't care, frankly, about the development and um, the wellness of your staff. And I, I would really encourage anybody who's in an environment like that, if you're a leader who's feeling the pressure to not spend that money um, to protect your bottom line, one, I would say you, you need to do everything within your power to be resourced yourself and to make sure that your team is resourced with things like earmark because the reality is the resources are out there to do this in a really cost-effective way. Um, the second piece is personally, as a people leader, I, I wouldn't offer a, a benefit like that to somebody if I was gonna hold it over their head for the next 
six, nine, 12 months, whatever that looks like, because that's going to be damaging to your relationship as a leader with that <laughs> staffer. Um, because you don't have the ability to assess, are, are they here because they're fulfilled in their role, because they enjoy their team, because the, they find the work that they do stimulating, or are they here just because I have kind of this ball and chain situation with this right. big conference that I paid for for them? Uh, and I think as a leader, that also would create some anxiety in me is, you know, as soon as this timer is up, are they going to be out of here? So I, I would avoid that situation at all costs. Yeah. Yeah, you got a good acknowledgement yep. of that. If I can touch on one thing, we've got the organizations on there. So let me say just a little bit about this, because this is something that our firm went through before we started offering webinars outside the company. So we've talked about a learning environment and having development plans and things like this. The third poll question was how large is the organization? And more than half of today's participants are in organizations more than 51 people. So we've got some good sized companies. Something you should consider doing is getting yourself registered with NASBA so that you can offer CPE to your employees. And so it's a process that you can go through that we did. I don't work with NASBA, so I don't remember exactly, but it was around $1,500 to $2,000, I think, for application and process to go through. We got registered and then our courses, of course, had to meet requirements. But as we taught things that we wanted our employees to know, they could also get continuing education for that. So it was essentially a free class. But the more important thing is people were very interested because it was CP and it was the kind of stuff that we said was important. And some can be on the personal development kind of things like Josh will do for us. And there are definitely some on the accounting side of what we do in there. So as a leader in your organization, that could be one of the things you bring forward. Um, and I did to mine, they said, great, and gave me some resources to help get that started. And so we did that for a couple of years internally before we decided we wanted to offer, also offer some courses externally. Blake, any thoughts on getting yourself registered and going through that? Well, uh, I don't know how NASBA, how quick NASBA was when you did it. How long did it take you to get your NASBA license? When we did the first, which was the group um, internet based. I think it was yeah. about a six month process when we did the self study. Yeah. Unfortunately, I started our self study part like in April of 2020, something like that. And when the pandemic hit their applications for self study went through the rough. That was like an 18 month process. That was really a long time. Yeah, it's it's quite time. It, it just takes a long time. I remember submitting the application and it took eight months to get them to uh, process it. Okay. Um, so <laughs> so that that's a barrier for firms if they want to do this themselves. Unfortunately, that's just the situation uh, I guess yeah. we're in because you don't have an alternative. Um, hey, at least it's not working with the IRS, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> here's actually something that, that I would love to put out there. We just launched um, a, a, a subscription called Earmark for Teams. So you can sign up your firm, like all the staff in your hmm. firm for Earmark subscriptions and pay for it centralized billing. So, you, you know, you don't have to buy it through the app. Um, as one of the features we want to add to that very soon is a private channel for your firm. So uh, what that would allow you to do is take your internal trainings that you don't want the public to see, right? That's just for your firm. And you can put them on a channel on the Earmark app and only your people that you've you know listed out would be able to see that on the app. And we use our NASBA license to provide the CPE for it. So you as a firm don't have to go get the license. So if there's anyone watching mm -hmm. that is interested in that for their firm, being able to offer CPE on demand for their internal trainings, we can do that very soon. And I'd love to talk to you okay. about that. Great. Yeah. And I think we have contact information at the very end that people can see how they can get in touch okay. with you. If we don't have that, please remind me and we can say, here's the way that people can get in touch with you around that. Awesome. Okay. Uh, what about, so I, I'm curious, the ec additional credentials. So that was another one that I yeah. thought of. If I'm coming up with a development plan, is it possible that some of those align to, and I'm, I was glancing at some of the AICPA ones like certified in financial forensics, personal financial specialist, accredited in business valuation. Any thoughts on connecting your development plan to a credential and what that's worth? I haven't done any of those myself. Um, I you know, it's funny, I, I'm kind of skeptical in general of credentials, like all the acronyms after your name, like beyond sure. once you're a CPA or a CMA, like, I don't know how much value it really adds in the mind of the public. Mm -hmm. 
from a marketing standpoint. So, because there's two reasons to get licenses and credentials, right? One is for your own knowledge, and the other is right. for the marketing impact, the value it has to yes. others that it increases your earning potential because you get paid more or it helps you get more clients. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd be curious to know your, your take on whether or not like being, you know, the CGMA or whatever makes a difference. I feel like right. that sort of credential is kind of like, nobody knows what it is. So does it really matter? Um, I think I would agree that that is kind of how it's come out that at least of my clients who are not in the financial world, that is not that important to them. Now I am thinking of Josh reviewing the development plan competency framework. I could see a mentor Maybe for a firm, and I, I'll just pick evaluations as an example. As I describe what I want to do, I could see either bouncing off them saying, hey, would it help if I do that? Or maybe that person saying, you know, when we work with people, we offer this service and it really helps if we can tell the person they've got credentials around that. And maybe that sets you on a path of saying, well, then my CPE is going to be focused in that area. And along the way, I'll pick up a credential if that's valuable. But, but like, I think it's a good point to really say, okay, does do people know, is it the knowledge that'll make it great or is it a good marketing tool for me personally that I can, now I get to sign things and people are impressed and they pay more for it. Yeah. Yeah. Just something I want to chip in from the, the people strategy side of that is I really would encourage for credentialing to follow interest and not mm. um, hoping to get credentials and find new interest because it is, um, Often, you know, when I think about forensic accounting or litigation services, some of those credentials are going to be really important and can uh, they can mean something in a courtroom or whatever niche you're working in. But I would encourage the people who join us, make sure that you've got an interest there and that's something that you want to press into as opposed to um, taking the perspective of, oh, what the heck, I'm just going to get this extra credential and hope that it opens some doors for me or um, see if I could pivot with it. I really would utilize that more of, okay, I've, I've acknowledged here's this niche that I enjoy working in, or I find that I have skills that are uh, suitable towards it. And I could take a step forward in an area where I'm already interested. I would encourage that perspective as opposed to a more uh, blanketed oh i'll just get more credentials because it'll be better i'll look smarter to people i think you're right like that most people have no clue what those letters stand for and it's not going to mean a lot in the market unless you're in a particular niche that really values those uh that credentialing yeah yeah it's, okay so what i do find it amusing when like, you know on linkedin sometimes you see people on linkedin and i apologize if if you have this but you know, you see them with like eight, <laughs> eight different acronyms at the end after their name. And I'm like, I'm looking at all of them. I'm like, okay, I know what five of those are, but I've never, I don't know the other three. <laughs> I wonder out. if you look them up, you find out they're not really anything. <laughs> they could, I mean, I could just make up some acronyms, right? Yeah. Like at that point. Uh, um, why don't we finish with one last question? So Blake, there's a lot of interest in Earmark. So the question yes. is, does Earmark have an affiliate program, but do you want to maybe broaden that to just what are the different ways that people could interact with Earmark if they wanted to, aside from being, I guess, a student is I assume what you would call it. Yes. Uh, well, so we call them uh, members. Our users okay. are members. Okay. And you can just go to Earmark, earmarkcpe.com. You can sign up, put in your email address. You'll get on our newsletter. We'll send you the link to download the apps. You can download the app for free, sign up for free, earn CPE for watching Summit webinars and podcast episodes for free, which is awesome. Um, and then you can subscribe in the app if you want to go unlimited. You can buy courses. Uh, if you want to buy it for your firm, you can contact me. My contact info will be at the end, blake at earmarkcpe.com. And the question is about whether we have an affiliate program. We do not have an affiliate program yet, but I would love to set one up. So if you want to be my you know, first uh, experiment with an affiliate program, I would love to do that. So just reach out to me. Um, we'll get it going. So um, yeah, that sounds great. Okay. So I've got a couple final things to bring. So the modern CPA success show. So this is one that Blake you even showed. And so this is one that you can get through the earmark CPE app. You can also see that you can find it on YouTube. So podcasts that we do, they are um, video format, and we will have clients on there. We have employees on there. We have guests, um, people who do different software tools, things like that. And so if you want to keep learning, here's another way that you can do that. If you want to get CPE, go to Earmark and you get CPE at the same time that you are doing that. 
we today has been very interactive so i really appreciate people's questions and things if you want to stay interactive we have the cfo community on slack and you can see you can get a free month's access to just check it out you can join other cpas who in this area are primarily offering cfo services ask questions collaborate you'll see there's different channels in there there are also some sort of live virtual kind of events that we have in there so a good way to continue being interactive if you're very interested in the virtual CFO work, we have a course, a pretty intensive course, the virtual CFO playbook. And I say intensive because it's 15 modules that you spend time going through. But this is the entire playbook for how we deliver virtual CFO services from designing your own piece to how we do our delivery that you could do, giving you our pricing tools. There's a free coaching session. It's part of this Slack network that I described for you, the community. And then also we have a once per week meeting that I facilitate where people come on in and just describe, hey, here's what I'm trying to do. It's working. It's not working. You're meeting peers. Oftentimes people are coming in and realizing they're trying to do the same thing. And so there's some great collaboration that happens. Um, and then finally, if you're saying all oh, this sounds great, but can I join you? Here's a shameless plug for yes, apply with us. We had a couple of questions about my employer is stingy and not doing this and that. If this sounds like you would rather come work with us, please check us out. We would really look forward to that. And I'm hoping, okay, we don't. So Blake, tell us the contact um, for, and I don't think we had it in the very beginning. Okay, yeah, if you want, I'll share my screen and then yep. I'll just show people the website here where they can go. That sounds uh, perfect. Okay, cool. So it's earmarkcpe.com and you can go to our website. You can put in your email address and that will be coming onto the screen in just a moment. There we go. Earn free CPE for listening to accounting and tax podcasts. Put in your name, email, we'll send you the link to download the app. Um, you can contact me at uh, blake at blakeoliver.com. Actually, no, do blake at earmarkcpe.com. That's the way to do it. Blake at earmarkcpe.com. So, okay. yeah, if you're interested, um, love to have you as a firm, as a member. And this is uh, on our blog, you'll see we've got information about the new Earmark for Teams feature cool. that we launched, and you can sign up for that. That is great. Yeah. Good. Well, Josh and Blake, thank you very much. Hopefully people learned a lot from today. I know I did, and it is really exciting. Um, so thanks for presenting a really good CPE event for us. Thanks for having me. Let's have a great day. Yeah. Okay. Bye -bye.